Today, as part of our Healthy Ireland at Your Library series, I'm talking to Brefney McGuinness of the Irish Hospice Foundation about understanding grief and loss. So, Brefney, can you let me know your, your work with the Irish Hospice Foundation, what it is you, you do? Sure. Um, I work in the area of bereavement uh, with the Irish Hospice Foundation and um, that's one of our key areas. A lot of people will know hospice for um, helping people when they're dying and supporting their loved ones. And I suppose a key part of that is supporting people after the person dies. And that's uh, the area of bereavement. And we have a particular section in the Hospice Foundation which deals with this. And that's the area that I work in. And would you be helping people before the death to prepare for that grief? Yes, and that's a really good question because bereavement begins before the person dies um, and continues through the person's death and afterwards. So we would work with people all through that uh, time, both before, uh, at the time of death and afterwards as well. And Brefni, what is the end goal of, of grieving? So the goal of grieving care is really about learning to live with the death of my loved one. It's really about helping me to integrate that person into my life in a new way. Um, it's not about getting over that person. It's not about fixing my grief. It's not about uh, getting rid of my grief. It's about how can I bring this person with me in a new way um, and relate to this person in a new way. They're no longer physically present. They are now dead, but they're still alive with me and through me. So the goal of grieving is to help people to learn to live with the loss in their life in a new way. It's an uncomfortable conversation to have, and I can understand why, but we should become more comfortable talking about death and grief because it's one of the most certain things in life. Yeah, I think that's a really good point. Um, it is difficult to talk about death. Um, most of us get up in the morning, we don't think we're going to die. And yet the reality for many people today in Ireland is that they will die. Um, so that, that's a difficult area to speak about and it's difficult for loved ones to speak about it. And yet, as you've said, if we can speak about it, it makes it easier for both the person themselves and for those <clears throat> excuse me, who are um, close to them. So how should we talk about it? Should we let everybody know what our, our preferences are? Should it be breakfast table topics? It would be wonderful if it was breakfast table topic. Um, I think we should take whatever opportunity might arise. It might be at the breakfast table. It might be uh, out on a walk. It might be uh, at a quieter moment with somebody. But I think the really important point would be to talk about our preferences, to talk about death, to talk about maybe what we would like um, for ourselves and what we wouldn't like um, and so that people know that beforehand because what can happen is um, if we don't have those conversations um, and somebody gets ill we tend to then uh, become quite I suppose emotional and that's natural we're trying to deal with the situation but what often goes out the window then are maybe the, the, the kind of quieter conversations around what would you really like what would be helpful for you uh, what would make a difference to you and if we know that beforehand, we can um, act on that. We can do those things. For example, I may want to hear relaxing music, a particular type. I may want to hear rock music. But if I haven't had that conversation with my loved one, um, they won't know about it. And then what tends to happen is people make decisions for us if we're the person who's dying, uh, which mightn't be actually our preferences. So it's really important to engage. It's a difficult topic. We don't like talking about it. Um, and I suppose that goes back to a kind of fear that most of us, including myself, would have around dying. Um, uh, and it is that, that that's a topic that we uh, kind of keep at arm's length. Um, but the reality is that all of us are going to die uh, at some point. And if we can talk about it to the ones closest to us, let them know what it is that's important for us, and also put in place the things that we need to do around um, our own affairs, uh, that can be really important, particularly if we have children and um, if we want to make sure that they're looked after. It's really, really important that we can say, well, look, OK, um, I have this illness. I may be dying. How can I 
um, put in place, what I need to put in place for my children, for my other loved ones, for my friends that are important to me. These are really, really difficult conversations and we really find it very hard to go there. I suppose what we in the hospice would try and encourage is people to um, acknowledge the uncomfortableness, but take a step over that and actually open up um, around those topics. And so what is grief? What is the definition of grief? Well, grief, very simply, is losing someone or something that's significant to me. And that's the key for understanding our own loss and understanding the loss of somebody else. What's the significance of the loss for that person? So um, my mother might die. I have two sisters. Each of us will experience different grief around my mother's death. Why? Because we're different people. We're at different points in our lives um, and we experience her death differently. I have a different relationship with my mother to my older sister. I'm the youngest in the family. So even the same death of a person in a family will be experienced differently by different members of that family. And that's sometimes what kind of give rise to tensions. In families we, you know, let's say, again, if I give the example of my mother dying, we might expect that my grief is going to be the same as my sister's grief or my aunt's or my uncle's grief. And it's not, it's different because we're different people. So grief is essentially coming to terms with a change in our lives. That's essentially what grieving is. It's adjusting to change. Um, and that change is very profound when it's somebody who dies. Um, because when somebody is with us and, and they're around us, we don't notice what it would be like if they weren't there until they're gone. It's like that hindsight that we have when somebody's gone and we realize, my God, I didn't realize I missed this person so much. And I suppose the message we'd like to, to give to people is that that grief is normal. And we have to be very patient, very kind, very gentle with ourselves around our grief. Understanding that somebody who has been a major part of our life and is no longer here, um, that leaves a hole inside of us. Um, and that hole takes a while to learn to live with. And I don't say get over, because it's not about getting over our grief. It's about learning to live with the loss in our lives um, and growing our lives in relation to that loss. So it's, uh, it's not a negative thing, but grieving does take time and it takes time to adjust. So one of the most important things that we would say to anybody who is grieving themselves or anybody who may be supporting somebody who is grieving is firstly, be very gentle, be very kind, be very patient with yourself allow your feelings and with grief we've got a range of feelings that can come at us from all different sides some of them might surprise us so certainly we may feel sad we may feel upset we might feel angry and um, we might feel guilty that we haven't done enough for our loved one and um, we might feel regret uh, and again when somebody dies we gain a clarity about that person that we don't have when the person is alive um, and we may look back and think oh my god why didn't I say to them that I love them more why didn't I maybe uh, forgive them a bit more why didn't I say that to them and um, and that is actually a normal part of grieving the going back the looking back over and each of us coming to terms ourselves with the death of that person and what they meant in our life and what they mean now in our lives and integrating that into our lives now. And how do you reconcile those feelings? How, how do you make peace with any of the, the questions or the anger you might be left with? Mm. It takes a bit of time. Um, and uh, the grief kind of comes and goes in waves. Um, so I suppose what we would say is um, this will be a process of adjusting. So. While death is an event, grieving itself is a process. And that process, uh, it isn't linear, as in stages. It's a bit more like a, a roller coaster. It kind of goes up and down. So how do we do that? It takes time. Um, and we have to be, as I say, very gentle with ourselves. 
So another uh, recommendation we would make for people who are grieving is find people who will just allow you to be yourself, however that is. If you're sad, if you're upset, if you're feeling a bit down, if you're happy and you don't want to talk about the grief today, that's fine. The real key thing is to find people who will just allow you to be how you are. And what we would say is seek those people out. You'll know them. You'll know when you're with somebody who can just say, look, it doesn't matter how you are. Just, okay, today I'm feeling sad. Today I don't feel like getting up. Today I don't feel like going to work. But does it come to a stage where at the start, obviously, at the, the funeral, the removal, anything like that, you're surrounded by people who keep asking, how are you? Are you mm. OK? Mm. Does there come a time a couple of weeks after that where you feel you shouldn't be talking about it anymore and you don't want to bring people down or people are afraid to ask you about it? We mm. shouldn't be tied down by, by timings. There's no timeline on grief, as you said. Yeah, I mean, there's a couple of things there. I would agree with you, you know, again, at the funeral, and, and we tend to do funerals fairly well in Ireland. People come together and that support is really important um, and really needed. But again, you know, people are saying, you know, how are you and how are you doing? Interestingly, grief takes a minimum of two years. We would say a minimum of two years, nothing else going on in your life, so all other things being equal, to come to terms with the major aspects of a loss. And uh, it's a bit like at the start, around the funeral and that, we tend to be in shock. And we're just kind of going on autopilot. Um, and what we would say is, uh, and the research would support this, generally it's around six to 18 months after a death where the reality of the loss begins to hit us. Um, and that is precisely that time where I think you're alluding to there, where people may kind of say, well, you know, I hope you're doing well, but you know, can you? Yeah, can you 18 months on, you might not necessarily really grab somebody by the hand and say, are you, are you doing okay? But that's when the reality hits, you say. Six to 18 months, yeah. Now it depends, that's, it depends on the person, it yeah. depends on the circumstances, but what we know is that initially after, uh, let's say the death of somebody close to us, uh, we tend to be in shock. And uh, what happens there is we just, we're, we're going around, we're doing stuff, uh, and the enormity of the loss hasn't seeped in yet or hasn't come to the surface. Um, so some of the really good things you can do for somebody who's bereaved recently is just make sure that they have enough of the practical things, food, uh, even leaving them around dinners or something like that. Check in, are they eating well? Are they sleeping well? Are they getting a little bit of exercise? You don't need to worry too much about uh, getting in too much to the death unless they want to talk about it but get them out, maybe suggest going for a walk if they want to, or whatever works for that person. Oftentimes people would say, um, after the first anniversary, the second year can be harder than the first. And that's often when the reality of the loss sinks in. The autopilot almost comes off more. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, the autopilot comes off. We probably have got through the, the first couple of months and, and, and all of the funeral and, and the adjusting and, and we're doing our best and maybe we've got a bit of rest and we're, we're, we're beginning to come back to ourselves and the reality of what my life means now without this person comes more to the surface. And that's why it's really good if you're supporting somebody who's bereaved to check in, particularly around anniversaries or key uh, times of the year, things like Christmas time, um, Easter, holidays, anniversaries of any type, if it's a birthday or a wedding anniversary, depending on the relationship you have with the person. And what's a good thing to say? Because it's very hard to know what the right thing is. So is, is there a yeah. wrong thing to say? Um, I, I suppose, maybe if we look at it in terms of, is there a right thing to say first? Um, the right thing would be if the person hadn't died. So what we would say to people is, don't beat yourself up trying to find the perfect thing to say. Um, be yourself, be authentic. It's absolutely okay to go up to somebody and say, I really don't know what to say to you. Uh, I just want, to know, want you to know that I want to support you. And at times like that, I think what's really important is that people get a sense from us of our humanity and our support for them. Don't be too worried if it comes out a bit clunky. Um, if you can try and avoid certain things, be aware maybe that we might feel uncomfortable, we might be struggling to find something to say. Um, what I would say is take the risk and say something. Try and think of how can I help this person? And if I'm really, really stuck, say, look, 
I just don't know what to say. I'm really sorry. Um, sometimes silence can be very good as well. Our presence with somebody can be really, really telling and really, really supportive. Um, just knowing that somebody is there and is acknowledging that this significant event in your life has happened. I think sometimes we forget to just listen and it's, it's coming from a good place that you want to say, why don't you try this? Have you considered that? Oh, I have a similar mm. story. But to just listen and say, I'm, I'm here for you is, is, is enough. Uh, that's a really good point. And, and if people were to take one thing from this um, uh, series, I suppose it would be to listen to somebody who is uh, bereaved. Uh, we do people a great service by simply uh, being with them and listening and let them speak about whatever it is they want to speak about or not, or just be in silence with them. Absolutely, listening is a really, really uh, important part. If a death occurs suddenly, that's more difficult. We don't have a chance to say goodbye. Um, so sudden deaths are more difficult than deaths that are uh, predictable. No death is easy, um, and, and it's not to to relativise any death. Because no the death loss is, is still the same. The loss is the same, absolutely. Um, but what we do know is that when a, a death is unpredictable, um, that makes it much tougher. Violent, traumatic deaths um, uh, are also more complex. And of course, a death that is out of time. So um, if uh, my mum dies, in, in some way I expect that. They're my mother and, and they're older than me and I think that's, that's normal. If a child dies, it's much more difficult because it's out of time. We don't expect it. We expect to uh, die before our children. Um, so the death of a child, extremely difficult. Um, and the sudden death of a child, particularly difficult. Other deaths like suicide, um, homicide, also can be very, very difficult, uh, just in terms of the extra layers that are there for the person trying to come to terms with this loss. And when you are hit with that sledgehammer of grief and maybe somebody is finding it difficult to even get out of bed in the morning, at what yeah. point is it time to, to get back to normal, to get back to work? And it's interesting, we, we, we have that sense of uh, getting back. We have to choose life um, uh, when we're grieving. And this is a, it's a, a funny kind of thing about um, grieving turns our world upside down. Um, there is a point where we do have to choose to live with our loss. Um, do we that, just let go and go with the grief or try and manage it in some way? Grief has its own rhythm with us uh, and it has its own way of, um, I suppose, helping us to come to terms with what has happened and to look forward to our life but it has its own rhythm. Um, and that can hit us at times when we least expect it. But it's also important to remember that there are periods in our grief where we do fall apart. Not to be too frightened about that. It's called the disorganization phase. And it's where, like we spoke earlier about um, maybe the length of time into the second year, oftentimes we, we might think, well, um, you know, this is my life now. My, partner is gone, what do I do now? Um, and there's that period of disorganization where what was normal before, I realize is now gone. And now I've got to look at what's my new normal? How do I adjust to my new, what am I going to make my new normal? That leads us in, if you like, to, to looking at how do we actually cope with our grief and are there models that we can use for understanding how the grieving process works? Um, one of the models that is very helpful is a model called the dual process model. Um, and what this tells us is that all of us are hardwired to cope with grief. And there are two types of coping that we do. We have what we call loss coping and restoration coping. Loss coping is where I'm coping with the person I've lost. It's where I miss the person, where I get what we call bursts of grief or a grief burst. And a grief burst is where I'm walking along, going about my business maybe a couple of months after the person has died, and suddenly I hear a song on the radio, I smell cut grass or something, and it just triggers the grief for me. And that's what we call a grief burst. And a grief burst is normal. 
And uh, if you're coping with loss and suddenly you find that you're um, just taken off or taken back into the grief, don't panic. It's normal. And um, just stay with it and the grief burst will pass. And that's part of the loss coping. The second type of coping that we do is what we call restorative coping or dealing with my life now as a result of this loss. Um, and that's about adjusting to my new life circumstances. It means doing new things. So for example, my mother died. She was the place where our family gathered. After her death, part of our restorative coping was finding a new place where our family would gather. And that happened to be my sister in New York. She took on that role. And you mentioned a change in circumstances and, and getting your head around that. So can you be in grief for somebody if they haven't already died, if, if they're ill, if something changes in your life? Yes, uh, and, and we can experience grief when, let's say, we know somebody is ill or they may possibly be dying. Um, that's what we would call anticipatory grief. Or if somebody moves away or, oh. you know, our life situations change, relationships. Can you experience grief without death? Absolutely. And particularly, yes, without death. Um, yes, you can, is the answer to that. Uh, and again, the key here is what's the significance of the loss for me? We absolutely can experience grief over losses that are not death. Um, as you've pointed out, it could be changing your life circumstances. It could be moving to a new country. It could be um, changing a relationship. Um, anything like that, absolutely. And even things like infertility can be a huge loss for people. Um, and some of those losses um, become hidden. In other words, we don't speak about them because we feel if we do, we mightn't get the support and do men and women experience grief differently? Um, that's a very interesting question, because traditionally we would have thought that um, uh, men and women would experience and express their grief differently. Um, traditionally, there would be a sense that um, women would be um, looking to the support of other women whom they might cry openly or express their emotions openly. Um, and traditionally, we might have thought of men as, well, they might appear strong, they might deal with it on their own, they mightn't talk about it. But interestingly, we would talk about grieving styles rather than grieving being gender-based. And what we mean by that is it's a bit like there's two ends of a spectrum. On one end of a spectrum, you have what we call intuitive grieving. And intuitive grieving is generally associated with the feminine. And that is... Um, an intuitive griever feels their grief and they experience it uh, uh, the same way as a man would, but they express it through their feelings and their emotions openly and with others. That's intuitive grieving. On the other end of the spectrum, we have what's called instrumental grievers. And an instrumental griever, this is generally associated with the masculine, an instrumental griever does their grief. So intuitive griever feels their grief, instrumental griever does their grief. They work through their grief through activity or action, generally on their own. And it's like you have two ends of a spectrum. And most of us are a little bit of a mixture of the two, but generally with one dominant. Um, the really interesting bit is you can have men who are intuitive grievers and you can have women who are instrumental grievers. And that presents a real challenge for women who are instrumental grievers. That is women who do their grief rather than feel their grief. And what that means is uh, they tend to, to deal with their grief on their own. They don't need or seek out the support of others. And um, they put their, their grieving into activities. There is a societal expectation on women not doing that. And that can create a bit of a problem for people, for women who are uh, instrumental grievers. Likewise, for men who are intuitive grievers. So we have expectations about how people should grieve. Interestingly, in, in the Hospice Foundation, with the bereavement support that we provide, um, the maximum amount of, of men that we have had, either in our bereavement support groups or in our support line, is 20%. So I'm, I've been working in this area for over 15 years never more than 20%. What we will find is 
men will call in and say, am I going crazy? I'm experiencing this. And if you talk it through with them and say, thanks very much, that's great. And they're sorted at that moment. So it's that bit of, am I okay? Am I going nuts or whatever? Um, we do find that more women engage with the, let's say, uh, bereavement support groups. Of course, we're living in very different times at the moment. COVID-19 has really affected the way people grieve, everything from funerals to yeah. being at the deathbed of somebody has changed. Yeah. What's your advice to people at this time? Um, uh, the advice would be to reach out to people who are um, bereaved at the moment, especially now during COVID-19. It has um, put an extra layer onto people uh, in terms of death and grieving. Um, key advice would be reach out, contact, whether that's by text, by phone, or indeed by letter. Really, really important, make contact. Because what we know really helps people who are bereaved is social support. And that's one thing that's been really challenged through COVID-19, um, where we can't access as easily the support, the moral support of neighbours, of friends. It's more difficult to do. We're socially distanced. Even the whole thing of physical uh, touch. You know, one of the things that you often find people need um, when they're bereaved is actually to feel the touch of a hug um, or, or a safe touch that just says, yeah. I'm here for you. The squeeze of the hand. The squeeze of the hand. And that's so much more difficult now with COVID. Also, we have the added complication of people not being able to perhaps be present to uh, offer their condolences, to show their solidarity or support to somebody who has died. And um, again, the advice there is reach out if you can't be present um, physically. Um, writing a letter is beautiful. Uh, and don't worry too much about the words that you put in, but just the fact of writing and sometimes maybe including a memory, a good memory that you have of the person. Um, and saying, look, I want you to know that I'm thinking of you at the moment. Um, text messages are really good, um, a video call, um, anything like that, but making, being proactive about making the contact with people. You mentioned how important it is in people's grief for their feelings to be validated and acknowledged. And one way you can do that for yourself is by realizing you're not the only one who feels that way. What are some of the resources people can reach out for to get support? There are really good resources um, which people can reach out for around bereavement. I'm going to mention the libraries first. There's great resources here in the libraries, both in the Healthy Ireland series. There's books uh, for both adults and for children. Um, the Irish Hospice Foundation has uh, an information hub called Care and Inform. And that's with all matters to do with end of life and bereavement. The Irish Hospice Foundation also has a bereavement support line. Um, and this is a free service which is available Monday to Friday um, and we'll be providing uh, the number for the Irish Hospice Foundation Bereavement Support Line uh, here. Um, there's also other resources available um, in the HSE, uh, have uh, resources on, uh, uh, I suppose, what services are available for people dying and also on grief. Um, the Irish Childhood Bereavement Network is an excellent um, network which provides a wide range of resources for children and grief. Um, that's the uh, childhoodireland.ie. Well, I did read a, read a really good line that <clears throat> you can't have grief without love. And I think it's quite comforting for, for people to know that if you're feeling the grief, it's because you had a, a great love. Yeah, I think that's an excellent way of putting it. We grieve because we love. We grieve because we connect with people. Um, I suppose the really important message is um, grieving can be hard and can be painful. It is a sign of our love. Um, it's normal. It's part of what and how it is that we are human. And um, what really helps is having others there who will walk some of the journey with us, who will listen to us, who will validate us, who will support us, and who will point us towards other help. Prevnian McGuinness, thank you very, very much. Thank you very much, Claire.